Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Winfield United and our service for this hot Sunday, July the 4th. We are so glad that you could join us this morning for a time of reflection and contemplation, to pray and to sing, to share our struggles and to celebrate our joys. For whatever reason you joined us today, we know we are glad that you did and we hope you know that you are welcome here. Do we have any summer visitors in the gallery this morning that would like to be introduced? You can unmute your microphone and do that now. Okay, if not, uh, let's turn our attention to our announcements for this morning. Um, as you noticed on the screen, you have until this Wednesday to place your Every Child Matters button order. Um, the cost is $5, so just drop it off to us at the church if you're able. Um, I suspect um, they will arrive sometime over the summer and we will let you know when uh, you can come by and pick up your button. Um, we are looking for some Zoom assistance for the summer Sundays when Verena is gone. So uh, in particular, we need help for July the 19th and the, is it the 19th? No, July the um, 25th and August the 1st. So it's going to be very simple those two Sundays. Um, it's just a matter of helping out with the muting of microphones and um, possibly screen sharing uh, video uh, music if that's not possible for the leader that day. And if you are able to help, if you could let Verena in the office know this week it's Verena's last week in the office before she goes on holidays. So if you need some technical support and want to kind of walk through the process, uh, get in touch with Verena uh, Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday of this week. And thanks very much in advance. Speaking of August 1st, uh, I just want to share, unless Jim, maybe Jim Taylor would like to share this news with us. Would you, Jim? It was up to you that you did it. So you go ahead. Can you unmute, Jim? There. August 1st, our guest preacher is going to be Gary Patterson, who was uh, Elaine 1977, I think, or something like that. Um, he was, it, this was his, it, it was interesting because I, I got in touch with him 
And his first reaction was, no, I don't want to come and do a service for you. And then his second reaction was, wait a minute, this is where I started my ministry. And it would be nice that the very first Sunday of my official retirement, I could have a service at Winfield United. So Gary Patterson is going to be back on uh, August the 1st. Unfortunately, I am not going to be here. I will be camping out in Tofino, assuming we don't have any fires or anything like that, closing highways. Uh, and I, I kind of doubt that my laptop will pick up um, that far away from home. Uh, so I need somebody else who can be the host for that Sunday, which really means only uh, being a kind of an MC, because once you hand it over to Gary, he'll just carry on. Uh, I, I told him that we have an order of service. I also said, if you want to talk for half an hour, nobody's going to object. So, uh, but I do need somebody to do the sort of the God moments and the, uh, the chat time afterwards. Okay, back to you, Joan. Great. Thanks, Jim. So looking forward to that. I will look forward to catching that uh, as a recording after uh, August 1st. So I have no doubt you will enjoy um, Gary's perspective on his years of service and um, give us some things to think about. And a thanks to everyone who um, came out to our Canada Day events. Uh, we had 12 people come in the morning to uh, commemorate our orange shirts and to help us place them along uh, Woodsdale Drive along the church property. And I think we had 12 again in the afternoon uh, for reading the 94 calls to action, a result of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission into residential schools. So it was some really good thought provoking conversation. And again, thanks to everyone who, um, who came out for that. Any other announcements that need to be made at this time? If not, we'll turn our attention to our God moments from the past week. And I invite you to unmute your microphone and share with us your experience of awe and wonder of the holy that you have encountered in recent days. I'm had my God moment and I'm going to show you a picture. Can everybody see that? Yes. Yeah. My, uh, my, my niece, my goddaughter had their second baby girl on the 27th and they were kind of wondering whether Miss Lily, who is two and a half, would, uh, how she would accept her. And this picture just says it all. It sure yeah. does. So beautiful. yeah, it's pretty special. <laughs> Thank you, Fran, and congratulations to all. That's a beautiful picture though. Oh, it, just, just, it says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Fran. I, uh, I had um, a really busy time over the last few months with my, with my dad. <laughs> and, uh, but what really amazed me and what is beautiful in a God moment was that so many people called to ask me how I was doing. And I thought, how beautiful is that? Mm -hmm. People from church, wonderful friends, I mean, that to me is an amazing God moment. Thank you all. Thank you, Madeline. Okay, my God moment is, um, I, I, some of you will have read this in the newspaper and maybe in, in my online columns, but I got to uh, be a donor at the new plasma clinic in Kelowna. Um, I wasn't the very first donor. That's what I'd lobbied for, but things didn't work out. Uh, I have some medications that they didn't like, and we got that worked out. And so this week I was in and I gave my three quarters of a liter bottle, uh, and, uh, and I'll be going back every, uh, in this case, three weeks, but from here on, I think every month. So, and it feels good. Oh, it nice. does. Jim, I just have to say, you're, um, you announced a few weeks ago about that appointment, and it inspired me to become a blood donor again after a 10-year absence. Good for you. So, yes. Thank you. Yep. 
when I was in Ottawa, I was just the opposite of you. I was a uh, pharesis donor. And uh, what they did is they gave me back the plasma and kept the red cells. <laughs> but it used to be a two-hour thing hooked up to a machine. <laughs> it's 90 minutes now. Hmm. And more tubes than they have an intro than an ICU. Any other God moments? We had many God moments over the last several days. We were with uh, Carolyn, our daughter, and four of our grandchildren for the first time in over a year. And it was marvelous. And another God moment for me during that time was our 16 year old granddaughter was driving late on on Saturday, after, no, on, on Friday after her work shift um, to, the, to the cabin in Invermere. And there's a dead zone where, the, where the, uh, your, I, your cell phones don't work. And so Carolyn was quite worried about her for the first time driving in the dark. She's 16 and coming through that dead zone. And um, so we got in the car and drove halfway and and met her and then and then caravaned back through that back to the cottage and but the the sunset as we were driving through the mountains i have some pictures i mean the sunset was red and gold and purple and it was i've got a picture and don said that looks like that big spruce tree is going up in fire but that's how the it was so colorful the and the to see the mountains and the trees in in that light was beautiful and then of course having Kendall leap out of the car and say I'm here <laughs> God moment after and yeah. having a hug with her for the first time in two and a half years because oh. we hadn't had those hugs even the last time we saw each other a year and a half ago yeah yeah oh thank you both thanks yeah, yeah. we're going to talk so, about the color blue today so yes sure go ahead um my I god moment Sorry. My God moment was on um, on uh, on the first on Thursday when uh, we were having our Zoom conversation after the reading of the um, the Truth and Reconciliation points, and uh, we were talking about the 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 so many young children and how how it came about and. I was finally able to put to words what I had been feeling because the group of people that were there gave me such a sense of trust and such a sense of intimacy that I was finally able to just break out those words. And it felt so good. Thank you, Sharon, for sharing that. It's all vulnerability, isn't it? It was. Mm -hmm. So I just like to say that it's such an incredible thing uh, to be able to live in the Okanagan. And uh, well, just this week, it was my first local cucumbers, my first local raspberries, my first local cherries, Swiss chard peas, the list goes on forever. It's been a smorgasbord week and wonderful. Indeed. Thanks, John. I had dinner on Monday with my nephew, that I, my oldest brother's uh, son, that I hadn't seen in 11 years, and his wife, and um, they just live on the coast. But um, it was so hard to believe that there are now 22 in his family. Um, and the hardest part for me was to realize how much those families had changed in 10 years. Um, I guess we all live in a little bubble that got bigger and bigger and bigger. But uh, uh, on top of that, to start putting the 55 of them that are still alive. And apparently now they've decided they want to have a family reunion. So perhaps something positive of this COVID is possible have to look at that possibility and we have to make some effort to make those things happen but it was uh, just overpowering hmm. that sounds very joyful gary 
Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, let's light our candles together. The light of the candle dances with the presence of the spirit, reminding us of the warmth of community that shines across our spaces this day. Okay, let's take a moment to center ourselves by beginning with some quiet and some words of prayer. God, may we notice you this hot summer Sunday and the colors that make up our world, the hues and the shades that lift our moods and enliven our spirits. May we find moments of contemplation in this hour together to think about the blueness of the holy and the ways it envelops us. Awaken our sleepy beings to notice your spirit in work in all ways and all things. With thanksgiving and gratitude for these gifts, we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is from More Voices, River. invite Gary Monroe to unmute his microphone and share in this morning's reading with us. Gary.
Can you okay. Good morning. After the heat wave we've endured this past week, you might find yourself thinking about all the ways nature has had to make adaptations. Those of the four-legged, the birds of the air, the fish in lakes and streams, the ants crawling about, found protection and shelter from the excruciating heat. Psalm 104 calls bears to, to notice, to pay attention to the creativeness that is lies in, in wait outside our doors for the temperatures to drop, for darkness to fall, so that the free, creaturely world might come out of their hiding places and enjoy the coolness the setting of the sun brings upon the parched land. Reading from uh, Psalm 104, selected verses. Bless God, my soul. The trees of God drink their fill. These those cedars of Lebanon, where birds build their nests, and on the highest branches, the stork makes its home. For the wild goats, there are the high mountains, and the crags and rock badgers hide. You make the moon to tell the seasons, and the sun knows when to set. You bring darkness on, night falls, and all the forest animals come out. Savage lions roaring for their prey, claiming their food from God. The sun rises, they retire, going back to lie down in their lairs. And people go out to work to labor again until evening. God? What variety you have created, arranging everything. The earth is filled with your creativity. There's vast expanse of the sea, teeming with countless creatures, living things large and small, with ships coming to and fro, the Leviathan, whom you made to frolic there. All creatures depend on you to feed them at the proper time. Give it to them. They gather it up. Open your hand, and they are well satisfied. I will sing to you all of my life. I will make music for my God as long as I live. May these reflections of mine give God as much pleasure as God gives me. Please, God, bless God my soul. Alleluia. May these words open us to the Spirit's presence. And may wisdom come to us this day. Thanks, Gary. Okay. Let me see if you can all see this this morning. I have a story I want to share with you all, and it's called The Blue Hour, written by Isabel Simler. Let's see if you can. The day ends, the night falls, and in between there is the blue hour. In that moment, a blue jay raises its crest and lets out a piercing cry. A blue fox slips through the Arctic cold. Among the water lilies, blue poison dart frogs gather, croaking to each other. And blue feathered songbirds all sing in one chorus. The water's surface wriggles with frantic silver blue sardines. Volturing guinea fowl eagerly flock together, perching on a tree branches with a final metallic cry. The blue hour settles in and nature becomes still. The wings of blue morpho butterflies sparkle against the morning glories.
forget-me-nots, bluebells, cornflowers, and violets fill the air with their fragrance. Among the branches, a blue racer snake coils itself. A bluebird's turquoise egg is cracking. A Russian blue cat vanishes. The countryside is quieting down for the night. Glass snails stretch their heads towards the sky. A blue throat, an indigo bunting, a blue crowned pigeon and a red cheeked cordon bleu are silently watching each other. A huge blue whale surfaces to breathe. The blue hour is fading. And at this moment, a blue dragon crosses paths with a blue ringed octopus. Little blue herons stand motionless. Blue monkeys go quiet. And a blue tailed damselfly lands on a blue milk mushroom. They wait for this moment every evening, silently, and night softly wraps them in its quiet. There they all are. Everybody goes to sleep. Here ends the story. I were to ask you what your favorite color was this morning, I wonder how many of us would respond with blue. Blue is a most popular color. There are a few hundred different shades of it in the artist's palette. This primary color, like all colors we see, is produced by a wavelength of light that reaches our eye. And apparently the blue color has short wavelengths. In the living world, beneath the red-like atmosphere, blue is the rarest color. There is no naturally occurring blue pigment found in nature. And consequently, only a small portion of plants bloom in blue, and even fewer animals are found to possess this rich color. The color appears with thanks to various tricks of chemistry and physics of light. The blue jay, for example, has tiny light reflecting beads arranged on its feather to cancel out every wavelength of light except blue. The morpho butterfly can be described as shimmering light blue mirrors, essentially covered with miniature scales ridged at precise angles of, to bend the light in such a way that only the blue portion of the spectrum is reflected to the eye of the beholder. So for us to see or perceive blue to our eye, intricately designed features of plants and animals have occurred. Wassily Kandinsky, the Russian painter and art theorist of the late 19th and mid early 20th century, describes blue as peaceful and supernatural, a deep and typical heavenly color the lighter its shade, the more calming it is. When in the end it becomes white, it reaches absolute calmness. Kandinsky's theory states, and I quote, color is the means of exercising direct influences upon the soul. Color is the keyboard. The eye is the hammer, while the soul is a piano of strings. The artist is the hand through which the medium of different keys cause the human soul to vibrate. 
Further to this, Kandinsky theorized color was not only appealing visually, it also represented sound and vibration. And he says, in music, light blue is like a flute, dark blue like a cello, and when still darker, it becomes a wonderful double bass. The deepest, most serene forms of blue may be compared to the deep notes of an organ. The heat wave from this past week has had me reflecting on this serene and cooling color. Every morning, I looked out to the cloudless sky to see varying shades of blue, and I'd have a very good sense of what the day would hold in store for temperatures. So perhaps today's somewhat sleepy reflection is about noticing all the wondrous shades of blue that are only made visible due to refraction and the reflection of light waves. The beautiful imagery of the blue hour brought me a much sought reprieve from the heat. The day ends, the night falls, and in between there is the blue hour. The animals come out to experience the cool after the heat of the day. It's not something we can control nor manipulate. It is all ordered in its own way and in divine time. As the pages turned, we saw the morpho butterfly spread her blue wings. The Arctic fox robed in his blue tinted coat. Scores of silvery blue sardines glimmering just below the ocean surface. My hope for today's message is to reach our sensing places. The heat has blanketed me this week and it has affected my sleep and resulting thought formulation. But despite the red heat of this week, I have been noticing blue and how it seems to have a divine quality about its many shades. There is something in the science of blue and its unique refractions of light that makes it a most holy and auspicious color. Author Rebecca Sonlet in her book, A Field Guide to Getting Lost, explains that the blue, the sky is blue because light at the blue end of the spectrum is scattered by air molecules as it travels from the sun to us. And also she writes, for many years I have been moved by blue at the edge of what can be seen. That color of horizons of remote mountain ranges of anything far away. The color of distance is the color of an emotion, the color of solitude and of desire, the color of their seen from here, the color where you are not, and the color where you can never go. The color blue is a yearning. It surrounds us, yet eludes us, all at the same time. Blue, in Psalm 104, made me, reminded me this week of the miracle that is creation. The Psalter sings, the moon keeps track of seasons. The sun is in charge of each day. When it's dark and night takes over, all the forest creatures come out. The young lions roar for their prey, clamoring to God for their supper. When the sun comes up, they vanish, lazily stretched out in their dens. Meanwhile, men and women go to work, busy at their jobs until evening. As forest fire is unleashed, its fury after too much heat and drought, we pray for the created order we have been given stewardship of. We hear this psalm with a view to our world leaders who will need to make changes that may see our daily living, living drastically and much different from the privilege and freedom of choice we experience currently. We pray for the cool blue colors of our natural world to surround us in calm and peace. That a blue hour may sneak upon us with the fading of the sun beneath the horizon and bringing with it cooling night breeze. How wonderful is our creation, Holy One. May these reflections of mine give God as much pleasure as God gives me. As I notice the color blue, 
the color of life and its varied ecosystems. May I relish the cooling and calming temperatures of the blue hour. Can notice the creatures that understand this rhythm of day's ending. On this hot and sleepy Sabbath, may I notice and give thanks for the blessing of this diversity and the wonders of blue. Amen. I'm going to invite Gary to unmute his microphone once more and read today's Minute for Mission story for us. Gary. Thank you. Our United Church is deeply uh, 
committed to working with the Muslims and others for peace and justice. On June 6th, not far from the oldest mosque in London, Ontario, a family of five out for a walk were deliberately run over by a truck. Three adults, one teenager were killed. A nine-year-old boy is the sole survivor. Police say the family was targeted because they are Muslim. In a statement, the United Church of Canada condemned the horrific and hate-filled. Many people in the United Church are weeping alongside the extended families and friends of the family members who were killed and injured in this premeditated hate crime and are grieving the innocent lives lost in this abhorrent attack, the statement reads, acknowledging the fearfulness that some of the Muslim community feel as a result. Did you know that 322 anti-Muslim hate crimes were reported in Canada between 1913 and 19, and pardon me, 2013 and 2019? And that's just the crimes that we know about. Prejudice runs deep. A 2017 study published by the English Reed Institute states that almost half of all Canadians have an unfavorable view of Islam, a perception evident in attitudes towards religious clothing. While 88% of Canadians support a nun wearing a habit, just 32% approve of a person wearing a hajjim. Our United Church is deeply committed to working with the Muslims and others for peace and justice. That's why our mission and service gifts help us as a church to develop statements and educational resources to combat prejudice and discrimination. Education begins with us. Your mission and service gifts help raise awareness and understanding that in turn contributes to a more peaceful world, one where no one is harmed by the hatred of another, where no more children have to grow up without their family. In the words of our current moderator, Richard Budd, let us use all that we have and all that we are to stand in the face of that evil that would allow and cause this crime of hatred. Even as one man has been arrested for his actions, let us uncover and work against the beliefs, the worldview, the racism, and the hatred that supported this choice. Amen. I find this whole incident to be so abhorrent as far as a different part of our world than I normally associate with. Um, I was horrified at the thought of anyone being disturbed enough to use a motor vehicle as a weapon to kill another family. And to this day, I'm, I'm absolutely horrified by the concept that it can be done, that there are people in the world that just kind of go on with their every day without that changing them. And I hope that we can all work together through the United Church and anything else we're involved in to make those changes. We have to, this, this, when I see these horrific things against the Chinese and so on. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. And thank you for your reflection on that as well. Because I think unless we speak out loud our feelings about these events, uh, nothing, nothing changes. It's another news event. So yeah, we will continue to, support United Church and its work um, uh, into interfaith relations. And yeah, we carry forward. Thanks, Gary. We are now going to turn our attention to our prayers of the people. So I invite you to bring to mind those people, family members, friends, people maybe who you don't even know their name, Maybe they're struggling today, or you've had an encounter with them that you would like to, to share with the community and lift in prayer. 
I'm going to invite us to pray today for Madeline's father, Peter Pryor. We've been pay- praying for Peter for a number of months now. And Madeline informed me this week that he has become palliative and is um, possibly en- nearing the ending days of his life. So we pray for Peter, for peace for his days, for Madeline and her siblings to reach out in this way and support in any way that we can. Let's pray. God of a deep and deepening peace, God of a calm that steadies our pace, may may we take in this time before us whatever moment we need to gather ourselves for the journey ahead, the concerns we name, the burdens we ask for help with, and find comfort in knowing we are heard. I invite you as you are ready to unmute your microphone and share with our community your prayer for this day. I'd like to offer prayers from my friend Tammy, who I work with. She continues to struggle with the after effects of having COVID with heart and lung problems. Um, She's had to take leave from work, long-term leave, uh, and is concerned about when she goes back to work, uh, that people will be literally afraid of her because they don't understand that COVID only actually lasts two weeks. So prayers for Tammy. Prayers for the many communities that are in crisis. I think of Lytton, I think of Florida, Miami, Florida, and the terrible crumbling of the building Um, just holding so many families who are living with fear and crisis and loss and sadness. We add to these petitions, those in our community, close to home and to our hearts. For Jay Dolman and her grandfather, great-grandfather, Peter. For Steve, Rebecca and family. For Tom and Muriel. For Lynn Roaming. For Matthew, for Harvey Wamsley, for Terry, for Sharon, Catherine, and Stephen, for Bob Prosser, for Vonda. For Hanny, we pray for Indigenous communities and all who grieve the loss of children and the future they held. We gather all of these prayers into one, and in the silence of this space, pray the words that have the most meaning for us.
Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is from Voices United in the Quiet Curve of Evening. So it's been good to be together again after a hot week. And I do hope that you are, none of you are struggling with the heat. If you or someone you know is, and if we can be of any help with that, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me. And um, we will see if we can find some fans or some means of cooling, coming down to the church and enjoying the lovely central air conditioning with Verena and I. Uh, yes, it has been just a godsend this week. And if you would like to enjoy that too, Yep, you can come on down. The Wi-Fi is free and uh, yeah, it'd be great to, great to be together and spell off this heat together. So as we leave this time, let's unmute our microphones and say with me our words of blessing and sending forth. <coughs> as we go, we, will count, we will count our blessings. Count our blessings. Embody our faith. Embody our faith. Embody our faith. Live an authentic life. Never look down on the struggle for life. Never look down on the struggle for life. Notice behind every face there is a soul at work. Notice behind every face there is a soul at work. And know that wherever we go, and know that wherever we go. The Spirit of God is already there. The Spirit of God is already there. Amen.